Okay, so for the last talk in this session, just before lunch, we're uh, very happy to have Rafael here, and he's going to talk about rational identity testing. Okay, um, can everyone hear me? Or? Okay, so the, this is joint work with uh, Ankit, uh, Leonid Gurvitz, and Avi Victorson. And yeah, today we'll talk about deterministic polynomial time algorithm for non-commutative rational identity testing. And the four of us actually gathered because this title was too long, a bit of a mouthful. So we decided to simplify, uh, make it shorter. <laughs> so we're going to talk today about operator scaling and applications to mathematics, physics, complexity, and optimization. I hope there's no physicists here. Don't understand much, but uh, OK. So all right, so I'll begin with the introduction and background. And the first part of the talk, I'll talk about matrix scaling, which is a problem, I guess, if you went to Avi's birthday, you all know. And then I'm going to talk about the generalization, which is to quantum operators and how we do operator scaling. And then I'm going to talk about doubly stochastic scaling, but just in the matrix case. And then there's a second part of the talk, which I hope to get to. Because apparently Zev said that once we talk about quantum operators, we never enter the three-hour loop. So all right, so let's begin with non-negative matrices and scaling. So if I give you an n by n, real non-negative matrix A, we say that this matrix is doubly stochastic. If it's rho or color sum, they're all equal to 1. So for example, this matrix, you can see that it's a doubly stochastic matrix. Now, what is the scaling of a matrix? A scaling of A is a matrix B and positive reals R1 up to Rn and C1 up to Cn. So OK, in picture terms, you can ignore that sentence. You just multiply the rows by some positive numbers and the columns by some positive numbers, and you get a scaling of this matrix. And we say that A has an almost doubly stochastic scaling if there, is ex if there exists a scaling B of A such that all rows and column sums of B, they are close to 1. They are, say, 1 plus or minus epsilon, right? So for example, here we have that this matrix has a doubly stochastic scaling because if you scale the rows by 1 thirds, 1 thirds, and the columns by a half and 1, you get the doubly stochastic matrix above. OK? Now, once you see this problem, you have three questions going on in your head. And if you don't, I'll give them to you now, right? So one, when does A have a doubly stochastic scaling? And if it has a doubly stochastic scaling, can we find it efficiently? And the third question is, well, what is the scaling good for in theory and in practice, right? So I'm going to address first the question number three, and then we go to one and two later in the talk. So Applications of matrix scaling, there are plenty. It's used in numerical analysis, signal processing. We can use it to uh, give a deterministic approximation to the permanent, a very bad approximation, but well, permanent is very hard, so you don't expect very good ones. Uh, we can also use it in combinatorial geometry, in incidence theorems for high dimensional objects, and many more. Okay, so it's very useful. And now let me define this generalization of matrix scaling, which is quantum operators. OK? So a quantum operator is any map that maps complex matrices to complex matrices, which is given by a tuple of matrices, A1 up to AM, such that T of x is equal to sum of AI, x, AI transpose. OK? That's conjugate transpose. And now, from now on, I'm going to refer to these quantum operators either by T of x or by the tuple of matrices interchangeably. OK? So a good property of these maps is that they take PSD matrices to PSD matrices. That's a very important property. And now you ask me, well, we need to relate this to matrix scaling. So what's the analog of row and column sums? And what's the analog of doubly stochasticity? So the first analog is going to be what I'm going to define in the next slide by the left and right multiplication. And doubly stochasticity is just having identity as a fixed point of two maps. Okay? What are the two maps? I just showed one to you. The other map is the dual map of T. So Given T of x, it's dual. It's given by, you just shift the A transpose and AI. OK? And then you get the dual map. Um, OK, now a quantum operator, we say that this operator is doubly stochastic if both the operator and the dual have identity as their fixed point. So T of i and T star of i is equal to i. Now, a scaling of an operator T consists of two matrices, which I'm calling. You can either call left or right or row and column scaling, such that I take the tuple of matrices A1 up to AM to RA1C up to RAMC. Okay? 
multiply on the right, on the left and on the right. Now, T has an almost double stochastic scaling. If there exists such matrices R and C of T of X, such that this operator is close to double stochastic, okay, to one size scale. Now, the three questions that always haunt us, they come back, right? So when does an operator have an almost double stochastic scaling? And can we find it efficiently? And the third question is, well, what is operator scaling good for? Well, since it generalized matrix scaling, it has all the, all the nice properties of applications of matrix scaling, but it has many more, right? So I can say, for example, in non-commutative algebra, this captures the word problem in three few fields and also allows us to compute non-commutative rank of a matrix. But if you don't care about algebra, which is okay, you can care about invariant theory, you can test the non clone membership for the left right action. But if you don't care about this either, there's quantum information theory and analysis and so on and so forth. But now I want to stress a little bit the optimization part, which I think a lot of people here care about it. So we can solve certain families of system of quadratic equations by testing this certain properties of quantum operators. And also we can solve certain families of exponentially large linear programs, which are captured by this breast complete polytopes, which I will not mention, but uh, you can look for the name, and they're really beautiful polytopes. Not well understood, but uh, yeah. Okay, so now let's talk about matrix double stochastic scaling, and then how we generalize that to quantum uh, operator scaling, okay? So now let's address these two questions. When does A have a double stochastic scaling, and if we can find it efficiently? So now the problem is, given a non-negative matrix A, is there a scaling to doubly stochastic? So in 64, 1964, Stinkhorn gave the following algorithm. You repeat it K times. Normalize the rows of A, make all the rows sum to one. Then you normalize the columns of A, make the columns sum to one, and repeat. If at any point you find something that's close to doubly stochastic, then output the scaling that you have so far. Otherwise, you just say no scaling. Now the question is, well, what is the K? And he, he proved, and a bunch of other works proved as well, that if the permanent of A is positive, then this algorithm converges in polynomial time. Okay, so K is equal to poly N. Now, for the rest of the talk, I'm going to ignore bit complexities of, of the matrix A, so just bear with me. I'm going to put that under the hood. And in particular, Lineal, Samoroditsky, Wigderson, they, they, they use this algorithm to appro deterministically approximate the permanent, okay? So now let me give you two examples of the algorithm N. So if you start with this matrix that has a how blocker, right? You can see it's a huge block of zeros over there. Then clearly this matrix is not scalable and the permanent of this matrix is zero. Now, how do we see that the algorithm is gonna fail? Well, first scale the columns and then you have this, now scale the rows and you get this other matrix, once you scale the columns again, you see that you never get close to double stochastic. Now, if I give you this matrix, and you can see it has a matching here, the Q diagonal here has a matching, now what do we do? Well, this should have a scaling. Now, if we scale the rows, we get this, and if we scale the columns, we get this expression, if we scale the rows again, and notice that now, all the mass is getting concentrated in your matching. I mean, this is a very simplified way, it's never gonna be like, it's not always gonna be like this, but you can see that the off-diagonal entries, they're going to zero, whereas the diagonal, the anti-diagonal is staying uh, good. So in the end, you should get something like this after many operations. This is close to double stochastic, okay? Now, how do we analyze this algorithm, okay? Let's analyze like Lineal Samoroditsky with Wigderson in 2001. So if the permanent of A is positive, then we can get a good lower bound on the permanent. The permanent is bounded by e to the minus n, so that's a really good start. And then, if as long as A is very far from doubly stochastic, the permanent of A is going to grow by one plus one over n after each of these normalizations, okay? So that, and we know as well that the permanent of any matrix that has row normalized, which is no, row normalized or column nor normalized, is less than or equal to one. So you cannot go beyond one. So within poly n iterations, we'll get our scaling. Or we can show that the scaling doesn't exist, right, if the permanent is not zero. <coughs> Any questions so far? Okay, I guess we heard this like five times in the last four days, so that's good. 
So now, okay, so let's talk about how do we generalize this algorithm to operator scaling. So the problem, again, is given my operator, uh, a1 up to am, right, or t of x, is there a scaling to double stochastic? And if so, find it. So Gurbitz in 2004 gave the following algorithm, okay? Let's repeat k times. Let's left normalize t of x, which means let's multiply on the left of the matrices ai by some matrix r such that t of i is equal to i. And now you messed up the dual, so what do you do? You right normalize tx. So you multiply now all the matrices ai on the right by some matrix c, and that such that the dual of this matrix is now has identity as a fixed point. And then you keep going. If at any point you get close to W stochastic, then you output the current scaling. If not, then you say no scaling, okay? Now, again, the two questions that Hunter does in matrix scaling, they come back. What is the potential function? And when or how fast does it converge? Okay? Um, good. So now, let's go to the analysis of this algorithm. So, Gurwitz was nice enough that in 2004 he also gave us a potential function, a candidate potential function, which he called the capacity of a quantum operator T, which is the infimum of the determinant of T of X, when you apply T of X to the determinant of X, for all positive definite matrices. Okay? And then he went on to show that, you know, if the capacity is zero, I don't know how to lower bound the capacity in general, but I know he knew in certain particular cases. And he went on to show that if T is far from doubly stochastic, then the capacity also grows by one plus one over N after normalization. And the capacity of T is less than or equal to one for normalized operators. So for operators that either T of I or T star of I is equal to identity, okay? So now the contribution of this work is to say that if the capacity of T is bigger than zero, then you have a good lower bound on the capacity. So you have a good start. And this guarantees that his algorithm actually uh, converges in polynomial time. Okay? Good. So now, to tell a little bit about the proof, I need to tell you a little bit some interpretations of the capacity. What does it mean, capacity to be bigger than zero, or capacity to be equal to zero? And it turns out to be a very rich uh, quantity, and I'm going to go on to describe it now. So Gurwitz, in 2004, he showed that if the capacity of T is equal to zero, is equal to zero if and only if there exists some positive definite matrix such that T decreases the rank of the positive matrix, okay? Which means that the rank of T of X zero is less than the rank of X zero. And he also went on to show, which is not very hard, that this last condition, so we call T of X is a rank decreasing operator, so the capacity of T is zero if T is rank decreasing, which is equivalent to show, to say that there are some vector space, some subspaces of C of N, such that V, v and W, such that all the matrices AI, they shrink the subspace V. So when you apply uh, AI to V, it go, it's contained in the subspace W, which is strictly smaller than V, okay? So we say that the matrices AI, remember T is defined by this matrices AI, that AIs have a shrunk subspace, okay? So capacity is equal to zero if and only if this matrices AI that define the operator have a shrunk subspace. Now the connections start. So in non-commutative algebra, uh, Kahn, by a series of results of Kahn, he shows that these matrices AI, they, have a sh they shrink a subspace V if and only if this linear matrix, sum of AI XI, is singular over the free skew field. Now, you might wonder, what does this mean? Um, and I'll tell you in a little bit. I won't tell you what the free skew field is, but uh, it's very complicated, but uh, bear with me for a second. Just think that XI's, they are non-commuting variables, okay? And to explain that, I'm gonna draw an analogy to something that we're very familiar with, the commutative world, okay? In commutative algebra, if you say, okay, now let the XIs commute, they are just variables. So we know that sum of AI XI is singular if and only if the determinant of this linear matrix is equal to zero. Now, in computer science, Valiant showed that this problem, deciding if a linear matrix is singular, 
captures the polynomial identity testing for arithmetic formulas. And, well, it was already a huge result, which became even huger when Cabanetta and Pagliasso showed that if you decide th this problem, whether a matrix is singular, is in P, then you get circuit lower bounds beyond current reach, way beyond current reach. Now, for, for non-commutative algebra, when you assume that the XIs don't commute, Amitsur, in the 60s, he showed that sum of AI XI is singular in the non-commutative world now, if the XIs don't commute, if and only if the determinant of the sum of AI tensor BI is equal to zero when you plug in any matrix BI of any dimension, for all dimensions. He didn't give any bound, he just proved this equivalent, okay? And moreover, Kohn also showed um, that this problem, deciding if a linear matrix is singular, it captures the word problem for the free skew field. And in TCS terms, this just means that we have rational identity testing for non-commutative arithmetic formulas, okay? You have arithmetic formulas with inversion gates. And, but a more interesting thing as well is uh, 14 hour in 2004, they also showed that we can define a, a rank of this non-commutative matrix, and they showed that this non-commutative rank is an approximation, is a two-factor approximation of the rank, the rank that we know and we're familiar with, of, of this matrix when the X size commute. Therefore, our work also provides this two approximation, deterministic two-factor approximation to compute the rank. Compute the rank. Now, um, I won't have much time to go into invariant theory, but so uh, the only thing I wanted to get out of this slide is just uh, this part. So please ignore the part above. We can go back to it later. Um, but in invariant theory, we pretty much uh, what Dirks and Weiman showed and other people also showed is that if the AIs, if the AIs are singular, if the sum of AI XI is singular, is equivalent to AI, sum of AI XI, the tuple AI being the null cone, which is equivalent to, again, the same familiar quantity, the determinant of sum of AI tensor BI, be equal to zero for all BI, for all matrices BI, when you plug in all matrices BI. But then, by a deep result of Dirksen in 2001, he showed that it is enough to take dimensions here, D, which is like they're exponential in N, okay? That's all I wanted to get through. So to test if the operator's rank non-decreasing, you only need to tensor it with matrices of exponential size, okay? So now, if we put things together, okay, just in a nutshell how the proof goes, if we know all of these connections, once you have all the weapons, I guess it's easy to tackle the problem, right? So from this, again, since we don't have much time, just focus on the last equivalent. So the capacity of T is equal to zero, if and only if the determinant of sum of AI tensor BI is equal to zero for all the matrices BI with dimension less than two to the n squared, okay? Now, once you have this last equivalent, the problem becomes very easy, and how do you solve it? Well, with three lemmas. So if you have two operators, T1 and T2, you can define the tensoring of the, the tensor of the operator, T, which is given by all the pairwise tensors. You tensor A1 to B1, A1 to B2, A1 to Bm, all the way to Am tensor Bm. And then you can show that the capacity of T is equal to the capacity of T1 to D2. So D2 is the size of the matrices B1, B, and D1 is the size of the matrices A. So you can show that the capacity tensorizes in a very nice way. Once you show that this lemma one, uh, you also show this lemma two that if an operator T is defined by this matrix C1 up to Cm, such that this matrix C, they span an invertible matrix, then you can actually get a lower bound on the capacity directly, okay? This is the bound that you get in the capacity. Now, you have to use lemma one and lemma two and the connection above to derive the following theorem. If T has capacity bigger than zero, then the capacity is exponential. How do we do this? Well, notice, if you have the capacity is bigger than zero, it means that for some B less than size exponential, for some matrices B, there is uh, an assignment such
such that determinants of sum of AI tensor BI is different from zero, which means that they contain an invertible matrix in their span. So we reduce from having capacity bigger than zero to this lemma two, to having some invertible matrix in their span, and then we get the lower bound. Okay, so this is the proof. And now, the good thing is LSW, they not only uh, compute, they not only decided whether there was a scaling, they also approximated the permanence. And here, we also, this algorithm G can be easily adapted to approximate the capacity to within one plus epsilon multiplicative factor. And things that I want to stress is capacity is a non-convex program, and this algorithm G is an alternating minimization algorithm for computing capacity. And this optimization problem, due to all of these connections, is useful to many areas of mathematics. And a question is, can this technique be used to solve other optimization problems? And uh, yeah, I'll end here. I guess the open questions are, um, yeah, do we have more applications of operator scaling in CS and optimization? And the other two. So thank you. Yeah, any uh, questions? So does it, do you have any concrete applications? Um, well, yeah, so in a sequence paper we had, uh, we can now compute the brass complete constant, which is, well, an application that I guess mathematicians care about. Yeah, so that's one of the applications that we're looking for. And there may be generalizations that are useful in many other settings as well. So. Oh, uh, no, no, so the, oh, so, uh, oh, yeah, so his question is, is this bound that Dirksen gave for testing, this two to the n square bound on the dimension type? Uh, no, so in this case, for this, uh, for our problem, actually, the bound, in like uh, a month after we did this, uh, the bound actually went down to n plus one. So, but it doesn't affect our work, we only need the exponential bound, which is actually good for generalizations, because we don't believe that generalizations of quantum operators would have uh, small dimension bounds for, for the degree. So, yeah. in general, no. In this case, yes. But we didn't know. Any other questions? <laughs> okay, so let's take, thank the speaker again.